I'm Rob Lucuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby here with actor Rita Wilson, director Rod Lurie and composer Larry Gruppe, who together wrote the song Everybody Cries, which features prominently in Rod's intense, immersive and moving film, The Outpost. Rod, I know you have talked about how you wanted the soldiers to have their own song, which they right. sing together while they're licking their wounds after deadly battle. It was a very, really satisfying way to kind of introduce a musical element into a war film. Talk us through right. why you wanted to do that as part of the narrative. Well, I actually, you actually hear the song very briefly uh, about midway through the film that, you know, when, uh, you know, when I was learning about combat outpost Keating and actually on every military base I've ever been on there, I've been people that play the guitar, they're musical and they, they make up songs. And like most units have their own song and, th and this, this unit had its own song. They also love to play Johnny Cash amongst themselves, but that was a little bit too expensive for us. So I always knew that there would be some song that the guys would have. And the idea would be that I would plant it a couple of times in the film sung by men. And then at the end of the film, we would come in with this beautiful mellifluous female voice. It would be a, a sort of a shock to the system. And I thought it would be, you know, really, really creative. We, um, at some point we had a guide track uh, there was a guy, a really guy with a great voice. He was a, had like a country voice and it was perfect. It just fit in perfectly. And everyone said, this is perfect, which is why I said, that's why we can't have it. It's too expected. Let's have something perfect, but female. And um, so that was, I always sort of looked at that as being a, a progression of how the song would, would fit into the, into the movie. What I didn't know is what the song would be about for a long time. It That's wasn't right. in the church. And so let's talk about that briefly as well, because um, what I took away from it and what, why it means so much to me, uh, especially when you watch and you watch and listen to it at the end of the film, is right. it's about the struggle to make sense of your life and to move forward. That's right. When someone close to you has died and it's so universal and ex existential. And for me, yeah. um, I found it immensely satisfying and, and therapeutic. And I was just wondering, did, has it helped you, Rod, particularly after the tragic loss of your son, Hunter? Well, that was, that was the whole reason for the song. Um, really, I, I figured out what the song was going to be because my son did die while we were on, in prep on this film. And I, had, I didn't even have, for a while there, while he was dying in front of me, I didn't even think I wanted to come back and make the film. My daughter told me, you got to go make this film. Because if Hunter knew that everything fell apart because of him, it would destroy him. And so I called the people Millennium and said, I'm coming back. Everyone needs to get out of my way. I'm dedicating this to Hunter. And um, you just need to get out of my way. And, and they agreed. And on the plane ride home, I knew that the song had to be about literally exactly what you just said. And, um, you know, death is, is universal and tears are universal. Everybody cries, everybody dies, you know? It's the thing that makes us one, it's the center of our son. You know, it's the, this is, um, th this was the define, it's, you know, honestly, man, you know, it's the defining moment of my life. And for the rest of my life, I'll be finding purpose for my son. But I also realized something else, which is that he was the same age as these guys who died in this battle. And, and I cannot begin to tell you. After he was gone and after it got, the news got out, those families started to call me. Because no matter what our station in life is, we share something now. We yeah. lost our adult son and we lost, and they lost their futures. But you know what we gave them? People die twice, Robert. They die when they leave this earth and they die when their name is spoken for the last time. Yeah. And we, we gave these soldiers and we gave Hunter um, with this movie and with this song, which they can listen to whenever they want, um, the right to have their kids' names spoken forever. So I know that's corny, but... But I got to tell you, it's ev it's fucking everything to me. Yeah. It really, it really is. It's everything. Yeah, it's so fitting for this film. Um, it, yeah. I, there's, there's not that many songs that I can say are just so 
like entrenched as part of the film's narrative. This is absolutely one of them. Um, before mm. I get onto uh, how Rita got involved, I'm very interested in how and what Larry brought to the table, obviously for your skills, Larry. When Rod was first inspired to record something and sent it to you, Larry, um, I'm wondering what you thought when you first heard it and recognized what Rod was trying to achieve with it. Well, first it was, what the hell is this? <laughs> it was if this, you know, terrible. My, my great voice. <laughs> yeah. And his, um, but actually what was embedded in that was very much the sincerity and the emotionality of what the song was and what, and I knew of course what was happening and what happened with Hunter. But so when I received it, the full impact of it was there. Um, also, because I knew that we wanted to design the song to have moments throughout the film. So when we get to its full fruition at the end, it of course makes sense. Uh, elements of the score that I wrote are actually in the song as well. So it all kind of marches us to this final blooming. Um, so uh, anyway, th that, that aspect of the design is in it. And I did want to keep it simple as if they were, and they were, we see little, pieces of footage where they're just with a broken up guitar kind of beginning the concepts of the song. So the song is certainly guitar based um, with other elements. I bring in a string quartet about halfway through just to keep pushing it towards its, its end and, and have that lift. So those are the, those are the things that went in it, but it's, it, it all came from the germ of, of this uh, just, you know, scratchy phone recording. So, which is awesome, you know. So it's it's a pretty long arc from there, from then to now. Exactly. I sang the song. We almost considered using my voice, but <laughs> that would have been cool. No. Maybe for the next version, you can do like a, a B side. We'll get right. To it. <laughs> um, but you know, Rita comes on board, right? And you know, it's so funny, just as an aside, we know when, when people say to, say to you, what are you doing with your life these days? And I'm like, oh, you know, I've, my interviews are going really well. And I've got Rita Wilson, Rod Lurie, Larry Group, Aiden Murray, and they're like, you know, Rita Wilson's a really good singer and she's a musician. And, and I'm like, see, people do actually know Rita, that you, uh, you do have that background, but some people perhaps don't. And I'm just wondering, talk us through how you suggested some changes to the music and lyrics to kind of ultimately elevate it to what we see in, in the final product. Well, the song came to me uh, in, it was beautiful already and I immediately responded to it because of how uh, truthful it was and how raw it was and how um, simple it was. And in my discussions with Rod, it was really about talking about how I think um, a female perspective might be needed or welcomed. Uh, I, to me, felt that the song was, I thought it was so brave that the song was as simple as it was. And it came on a, on a guitar vocal because to me it was people in, in, in so many cultures Music is played in a way to allow people to grieve and to allow people to have the music speak for what they can't say, whether it's music with words, whether it's a hymn, whether it's an instrument. Um, you know, they shot the movie in Bulgaria. My dad was Bulgarian and when he died, they brought uh, this incredible female a woman who who sang like almost like lamentations and uh, the instrument that was accompanying her was called a guida, which is like a bagpipe. And to me, it, it felt like the song was giving permission for people to have um, whatever emotional experience they, they might want to have in terms of, you know, where where the movie ended up. So uh, we had discussions about that, about um, particular lines and also just about the kind of connection that we, you're, we're trying to get to. You know, one, one of the things that I think is amazing about Rod and Larry is that they were open to that. They didn't say, no, it has to be this way and that's, it's, this is it. It was an open artistic conversation, which I, uh, they made everything better in in a way, you know. Just not—I don't know if "better" is the right word. Made it more 
even deeper or even more connected between you, all you of know us. If, if i if i may leave in for, there were a couple of lines that were like we're going to keep that line you know because for for for, for many reasons but um here, here is a gold derby exclusive i've never told anybody this i had a line there that um i thought was a great line i had written it and everyone told me it's completely offensive and you can't keep it in the song or it's offensive to many and i'll tell you what that line was it was who will be the last to remain okay and right now it's uh, in the land of god and pain right i think that's where there's only god and pain there's only god and pain right um but it used to be um who will be the last to remain where even god has gone insane now i thought that was a great line and i thought but what I was told, you know, I'm, I'm a, not a believer, I'm an atheist. And I was told that that line would be incredibly offensive to many believers. And this movie doesn't set out to offend anybody. We want to tell the truth, you know, and I, we didn't want all of a sudden to, to have people say, who, who are these guys? You know, you know, and, and not only that, but some of the soldiers were religious. So, um, and we thought maybe worse yet, the families might take offense at that, that line. And so, you know, I, for a while there, I was digging in my heels as an artiste. And, um, but that was like um, uh, trying to figure out, um, you know, the, the God and pain version of it was, this was something that Reed and I, I think we sent like, and Larry too, we sent like 10 different versions of what I mean. I don't know whose idea ended up where, but that was part of that, part of that, part of that, uh, that spirit. And also, you know, re, you know, Rita, you know, will tweak lines so that the way that she knows her instrument and knows, you know, better, you know, there were contractions that we made into not contractions. So because Rita just knew what was best for her. And, you know, and that was, um, and that was really important. And the end result is the song as far as I'm concerned, is a gift to the families and a gift to my son. And, you know, really incredibly grateful for, you know, everything so that Larry and did. The, this is, you know, it's interesting if you're not, at, like we're in indie, so we're not like, uh, you know, a huge, we don't have a huge studio system behind us, like putting our songs out there and, you know, uh, all of that. We're, we're the little engine that could, and, and it, that's a, it actually a great place to be in. But one of the things that was really cool was that, um, you know, now we have all of these tools that tell us, you know, oh, your song is doing this and that and, you know, whatever. But I kept on getting this, this alert on my Apple for Artists um, app, which kept saying that the Shazams were going bananas for this song called Everybody Cries and like Shazam then picks it up and then they put it on their list and then radio stations were picking it up and putting it on actual radio play. But what that told us, because we don't know, we don't have this information is that when people heard the song at the end of the movie, they, they wanted to know like, wait, what's that song? Because a lot of people don't spend the time reading the credits like we would do. And yeah. even on Netflix, they just it goes into that little tiny screen, yeah. and you know you can't read it even if you wanted to. So we we knew, and we started to you know understand that people, uh, the song was resonating with people, which made us feel really good because you put stuff out there and you write it, you don't know, you really don't know if you know, especially if you're a, a small indie film like we are. So. Um, I, I felt very, it was a, a really gratifying feeling to know that, okay, thank you for listening. <laughs> you know, thank you for staying and listening. It's like, it's, it was the equivalent of like, oh, they didn't get up and walk out of the theater when the credits started rolling, they stayed. And that the Shazam was sort of the virtual proof of that, I guess. Wow, that's so fascinating because yeah, I, I, it just, I didn't expect it either. And normally with the credits, I might watch a little bit of it and then I'll move on. But yeah, this kept me transfixed. And I think 
this is one of the main reasons why the song is so effective because this film ratchets up the tension constantly, right? We never get a chance to take a breath. And I'm all, I, I watched half of it like this. And um, <laughs> this, what the song does is in, in there's like two places throughout the film and then at the end there's a third place. It allows you to take a breath because we're always waiting for that next bullet, right? And so there's a lot of weight in what the song achieves. And I'm just wondering, not only because this song is funereal in some ways, it was for me, music, yeah allows you to feel something. But Rod, were you also considering how the song did give the audience a very much needed chance to take a breath? Yes. Oh, you know, absolutely. And, and we remember we begin the song over the memoriam to, uh, to the men. And there's something else really great about Rita is her diction is so crisp <laughs> and you can hear every word. And I think that people stick around to hear the words as well. And to listen to the lyrics and so you know I, I created this thing I wanted people to be through the final credit credits even through the scroll so I gave them a song that I thought was very effective and very beautifully and crisp and crisply sung and then right after that I started playing documentary footage of interviews with the actual soldiers right and so hopefully we, we can keep people you know, on Netflix, they sort of give you an escape door out of the credits, and I hope people don't do that. I hope that they play the, I want to watch the credits. I, I don't think they get that too often. But I, I do know that when it was on VOD and so on, that one of the um, things that people respond to the most were, were in fact, um, the, the credits, the credit sequence with the, with, the real, with the real soldiers telling the story. And that's always effective, you know, when you have, when you have the real guys there, you know, um, Robert, in the entire movie, everybody is referred to by their last name. On a military base, nobody knows anybody's first name. I didn't know the first names of anybody in the bases I ever worked in. That's Jones, that's Johnson, that's Wilson, you know, that's whomever, right? That's Groupe, you know, but I don't know their first names ever. Nobody knew Carter, you know, Carter is one of the Medal of Honor recipients, played by Caleb Landry Jones, in the greatest combat, one of the greatest combat performances of all time, I might add. Oh, Incredible. And, and um, but nobody knew Carter's first name. They just thought he was an asshole. They said, <laughs> he, he was either the asshole or oddball or he was Carter. Yeah. He was never Ty. And right. what we did, what we did, and what I did to try to really amp up the emotion is, Never a first name in the entire movie until at the very end when you meet the soldiers with the song sung by Rita, you see it's Michael Scusa, Stefan Mace. And in every way, I was trying to bring their humanity and their realness as people um, into the fore all in, all in one swooping shot. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's so humanizing, you know, like it, it's, it's completely a different thing that, you know, you're with these guys so intensely throughout the whole movie and you, you see what they do. And then at the end, you realize that's somebody's son and somebody's brother yeah. and somebody's right. cousin or uncle or, you know, husband. And there's just something really powerful about bringing that home in right. a way personally you know, yeah you know um and the other thing to really elicit the emotions is done with larry's group a score yeah. because it's yeah. not an emotional score in, a, in the obvious sense of the word it's not a sentimental score what what larry did what we always do and larry can speak to a little bit about this, I know the score isn't necessarily a subject here, but it's important, is that we, we, we oscillated between uh, major and minor keys throughout the entire film to give both the impression of um, the, um, the ins inspirational nature of what these guys are doing, standing up for their brothers, having a toughness to them, having a joie de vivre, and the tragedy, the major and the minor keys. Right, Larry? I mean, that was the... That's, that's exactly it. That was the device. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I was going to ask you, Larry, actually, before we go, um, I always ask composers this. I have the pleasure of speaking to so many composers and because I'm such a fan of um, film scores, the strings that you um, employ in the song, I think strings for some reason always seem to evoke very deep, profound emotion. Why is that? Why, do you, why did you decide to use strings in this song to really kind of hammer home how sad and how profound the song is? Yeah, that's a very good point uh, and observation. Um, strings, I mean, for the for the composer in general, not just film, but it's certainly also true in film. It's just that kind of glue that just really cements in the emotional content that you, as the composer, want to deliver. It's um, strings are or have oft, often been said the most close to a singer, the, the way that the, they play and they emote. So there's something about the connection aspect with the strings that are there. Having, you know, a distant trumpet, which I used in sparing ways uh, specifically for Keating, um, you know, has its place and, it, and it's a very iconic thing. Uh, but the, the the vast array of where strings can go and what they can do uh, is is why we use them. I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly no, the right way, but exactly. it's, it, it, it's the it's the best paint paintbrush I've got. Yeah, it's so evocative. Um, you know what, guys? I I we could talk about this for hours. Unfortunately, I have to let you go. But everybody watching this video, I'm sure you've already seen the outpost. It's been such a massive hit, especially on streaming platforms. But if you haven't, do yourself a favor and give it a watch. And uh, guys, good luck with the song this upcoming awards season and hopefully the film as well gets the recognition that it deserves. I really appreciate your time today. And we really Thank appreciate you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your and, time. Uh, all right, mate.